So they did a deal with Warner to say, we're going to sign 20 albums worth of output generated by your algorithm. Hmm. No human involvement other than they click the button to say, generate 20 albums worth of material and then arbitrarily sliced it up into 600 segments that were all about the same length and then hired out to a third party company to name all the songs because naming 600 right. <laughs> tracks was just too much work. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> and, and now they, they have 600 a- songwriting credits. Hey, hey, welcome to the new music business podcast brought to you by Ari's Take. I am your host, Ari Herstand, author of How to Make It in the New Music Business, the book. Today's guest is Danny Deal. She is the music and technology writer for Verge. She is also a DJ and she DJs clubs and she's played Lollapalooza and she's played EDC. She's played Wrigley Field with Fallout Boy. She has toured the world. She is based in Chicago. She is the actually vice president of the Recording Academy Chicago Division. We, needless to say, she has a rap sheet longer than I can receive site right now and it is very intimidating and inspiring and exciting and daunting but we talk about a lot and we actually dig into some issues concerning being a woman DJ in a male dominated industry and what that's like and the bullshit she has to put up with as a woman DJ in this industry and in this world. So we talk about that. We also, she gives some tips about how if you're a DJ and you want to break into becoming a professional DJ, how you can go about doing that. We talk about AI, artificial intelligence, because she has been covering that for Verge for a little bit now. And we discuss what AI in music actually looks like now. Of course, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Ari Herstand or at Ari's Take. And then please sign up for the email list That can be found at ariestake.com, where you'll be notified of all upcoming events and get regular information on the goings-ons in the music industry. Let's cut to it. Welcome to the show, Danny. It's good to to have you here. I'm very excited to to dig in. I am so excited to be here. So uh, you're a DJ, and you still... uh, I saw on your Instagram that you're still... DJing regularly. You did a rave uh, not a couple weeks ago. Um, mm-hmm. I want to hear, like, kind of just as the artist, as a DJ, as a creator, um, as someone who's in that realm, kind of um, how you got your start um, and then how that's evolved over the years. Because now, as a journalist, as a speaker, uh, I mean, you wear so many hats. I can't, I, I read it in the intro, but I was like trying to just kind of keep up with everything that you're doing. Oh, no. And it's, <laughs> I mean, it's incredible and it's very inspiring. Um, and I'm, but, but you still hold on to uh, the art that you do and you still kind of make space and time to DJ. And, and I'm curious about kind of just like the, uh, the beginnings of that, but then where, how it's brought you here. And if it's something that you, it's, is still really important in your life to kind of stay as that, um, kind of, uh, stay in that world in that scene. Actively. Oh yeah. Oh, it's important for any number of reasons. One, because we all need a creative outlet so we don't go crazy. Sure. And also, I still find that it's really imperative for me to perform and to be active as an artist, mm. as someone for other women to look up to in a position of power, as someone who's on the stage who is performing. That That is something that is still uh, underrepresented. Mm-hmm. And I, I was directed to a piece that you did, actually, a few months ago that... Mm-hmm touched lightly, well, didn't touch lightly, (laughs) very much went into the topic of the discrepancies that happen between genders in the music industry, primarily because we operate in a world that does not have uh, corporate HR, that doesn't have a lot of structure, we're we're in spaces that are not monitored. And there's a lot of things that prohibit women from rising to the top a lot of the times. So I find that it's important to be active for that reason as well. Well, that, I mean, 
let's launch into that. I was going to actually uh, come to that a little bit later, but I'm glad you brought that up and, and I'm glad you read that piece that I did. I mean, I interviewed a lot of women for that um, because, you know, as a man in the industry, uh, I have been pretty oblivious to a lot of it. And I think most men are. Um, and so I think it just takes men uh, really just listening and talking to women and asking them to tell their stories. Um, and so I, I'm when you say that you you want to be a um it's it's important for you to stay active to be a role model for uh younger women kind of in the industry uh did you not have many role models uh, like women uh dj role models growing up or or kind of um or was it something that you you did have and and but you realized as you kind of grew that uh, wow there's actually not too many of us and it's important ding, ding, ding. for that representation yeah it's the second one Okay. I, I mean, growing up in Chicago, it's the birthplace of house music. There were mm-hmm. so many people that I could look up to. And in particular, there was a quartet of DJs called Super Jane. And it was all women DJs, Colette, Heather. They were amazing. And so I had cool. people around me that were very diverse that I could look up to and uh, club nights I went to that were very diverse. And there was no reason for me to believe that there was any limitation placed mm. upon me because of it. And then um, as you kind of grew with your career, then you kind of realized it's like, oh, okay, there is a lack of representation here. And, sure. and did, you, did you feel that? Uh, was, it, was it a, did it become more lonely as you kind of got, uh, grew in your career and you said like you, your counterparts, your peers weren't, uh, or I guess were primarily male? Yeah, for a long time, there were things that, I didn't realize were not supposed to happen until I got to a point in my life when I could reflect back and say, you know what, that was egregious. That's awful. Um, like, those what? Are, like I remember playing in Texas one time and the promoter dropping me off and asking if he could come up to the hotel room. And then after I said no, he ordered a bottle of champagne sent to the room along with strawberries and chocolate. So, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Wow. Yeah. Is it, yeah. Say, saying it now, very obviously, everyone would say, whoa, that's not okay. But yeah. when you're 18, 19, 20, 21, and yeah. you're DJing full-time, and you haven't had a lot of life experience or corporate experience to know mm-hmm. what those boundaries are, mm-hmm. you just think, oh, gosh, that guy's creepy. I'm just going to shrug it off and let bygones be bygones. Sure. What do you mean corporate experience? What, what's the difference when you're dealing with uh, people in the, uh, like promoters in the industry, live promoters versus what, what is the corporate world? Oh, that, that's interesting that you bring it up because when I say corporate, I'm talking about larger institutional corporations that have a means to actually report bad behavior. Not that that. Uh, like solves- HR department. Right. Not that that solves all problems all the time, but at least you know that there's a method, a place for you to take your grievance and complaint to. Because I find even with a lot of promotion companies, they're small enough where there is no HR. Sure. So who would you talk to early on about these kinds of experiences when you eventually realized, okay, this, I feel weird about it, but maybe this is just how it goes. But were there people that you could confide in that kind of, uh, maybe other women that kind of gave you uh, guidance on how to navigate <laughs> these situations? Yeah, I, th- I think that when you're naturally part of a marginalized group, those are the people that you talk with and you lean on mm-hmm. for advice because you have a similar life experience. So there's there are groups that I'm a part of online, like Nap Girls, that are a resource for, they're a sounding board essentially for when people want to navigate certain topics or need a place to just air out a complaint or get advice or whatever. Mm -hmm. There was definitely, there was a, a, unfortunately, it's too bad that it had to get to this point for me to realize it was not okay. But the tipping point for me where I said, this is insane. I'm not going to take this anymore. Actually involved physical assault in front of an audience in San Diego. Um, What happened there? Yeah. I put the, I actually wrote about it on Twitter maybe a year ago for the first time. Ah, I read that thread. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, For those of, yeah. yeah. People who haven't read it, can you kind of tell the the story? 
TLDR is yeah. I was playing San Diego on Halloween and after my gig went to another gig to support a friend of mine also from Chicago who was playing just coincidentally a few blocks down. Mm-hmm. So I went to go drop off my backpack in the booth and he turned around and instead of giving me a hug, he reached out with both of his hands and broke me in the DJ booth in front of the crowd. And the, uh, the promoter saw it, the GM saw it, and they all just basically said, we're very sorry, but nothing was to be done. Uh, and that, I mean, you, I, I, uh, appreciated that you called him out publicly. I mean, you, it's Tony Arzadon, like you mentioned his name in the thread and you're, um, and that, but it's so, um, I guess it uh, sh- shouldn't be surprising. It's surprising to me, but it probably it shouldn't be that, uh, pe- more people weren't kind of shocked by that or that, uh, they kind of just, um, tried to downplay it. Um, that's, I mean, was it because it was, I mean, but you even meant you went on to say, even after the fact, uh, mm-hmm. their management tried to downplay, say it wasn't like trying to tell you <laughs> it wasn't right. a big deal, um, right. which is also very odd. Um, so, I mean, but that's, I mean, but frankly though, it's not very odd. That's what happens yeah. a lot of the time when yeah. there are complaints about things that happen in green rooms or in other places of venues where there aren't any cameras mm-hmm. or as what happened with Tony in plain sight, but everyone is drunk. So really who's accountable for that um, mm-hmm. would be the stance that I think a lot of people would take. It's, it's very difficult. Um, it's, it's very monitored in a way, but also there's less accountability than in almost any other job. So what I'm trying to get at as um, a man in this industry and hearing these stories uh, mm-hmm. all the time from my female friends and, and, and now being trying to be much more aware and noticing when something like this happens and, and trying to be an ally in the sense of like how I can best step in or when is appropriate. Um, like I, I would tell a story that just happened literally last night after a show, we were at a, a bar with some of my uh, friends and we're, we're hanging out there ordering drinks and she's um, this guy comes over uh, and, and they kind of, they, they uh, say hi to each other. The a friend of mine and she's uh, says hi to this guy. And, but it's, it's clearly that they're, they're not, they're acquaintances in the scene and he comes over and he's kind of tipsy and he like puts his arms all over her and she's clearly very uncomfortable. And I'm like, Whoa, Hey, how do you guys know each other? What's going on? He's like, Oh, it's, we know each other from the music industry. And I'm like, okay, this is uncomfortable and weird. And I'm mm-hmm. like, <laughs> and it's like, he was then started to get aggressive and it's like, give me sure. a sip of your drink. And she's like, I don't want to give you a sip. It's like, oh, that's weak. Why not? Give me a sip. Oh, like, my, oh my gosh. Like, this is like, this is going to get bad. Yeah. And, but I'm like, this is not unique. Um, right. And this happens. And so like, I, what are like, I'm trying to find the place for male allies mm-hmm. and like, what, I, do you have any advice for for guys, um, not even just uh, like, yes, allies to kind of uh, how to support uh, women in these situations, but also just advice for guys in general who may not realize that they are um, harassing. It sounds Hopefully. it sounds weird to to say that, but like they may not realize it. Like there are some guys absolutely. Like, in that article that I wrote um, was discussing about how guys don't realize that it's inappropriate to make a pass at someone in a session. Um, I don't think they're necessarily bad guys. They just don't realize like you, that's, that's a boundary that you, you have to set up. That is not acceptable, but like, right. yeah. Do you have advice for just guys yeah. in general? Honestly, sometimes it, it's as easy as saying where you make your music or where you perform, you should treat the same as an office in mm-hmm. a corporation. And a lot of people just don't make that simple connection. This is the place where you are sure it's a creative activity, but this is your livelihood. This is your job, right? So it's a creative space, but it is your job and you should treat it the same as you would any other office. And for some people, really, that's like the only explanation that they need. And they're like, oh my gosh, I totally get it now. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious with the, situation that you just described earlier did you intervene any further past that one 
I was, so this is like, it, it, um, I was like trying to toe the line. I was standing right there and he's kind of all over her and she's like, she, I mean, she's basically, um, clearly giving off the signs that this is not comfortable. And I kind of kept trying to step in and diffuse and be like, Hey, like, this is what's like, what's going on? Like, you're not really that close, huh? Like what's, <laughs> and, uh, and then he's like, well, let me have a sip of your drink. And she's like, no, he's like, that's really weak. You're not going to give me a sip of your drink. And like, and then he's kept pressing him like, yo, she doesn't want to give you a sip of your drink, her drink. It's like, that's okay. Like, yeah, let's move on. <laughs> what do we like? What do you like? The, yeah. What's the deal? And he kept like, then he started calling her names like, yo, this uh, is not okay. And, but then I'm like, I also, I could see it. I was like, I don't want to, like, I don't fight. I'm not like, <laughs> I don't right. like, but I could see him like egging on, like getting to that point. I'm like, man, what do we like? I didn't even know what to do in that situation. Yeah. So like what I would have done, I think yeah. what you did is great. First of all, the fact that you were able to identify that behavior, you were willing to interject yourself in a situation that did not involve you, but you knew was not okay. Like many yeah. people would not even go that far. But what I would have probably done as well is just mm -hmm. ask her, say, are you comfortable with this? And mm. if you need any help, like you can come and find me. And just use me as an excuse, or, or I would have alerted as a security guard to say this guy's being weird. Can you just check? Yeah, out? yeah. I was I was right at the point of about to go up to the the, <laughs> the bouncer and be like, "Yo, this dude." And I think the bartenders kind of because we were right up the bar. I think the bartenders like picked up on it and closed their tabs out and was like, "Okay, you guys are done." Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and it's I I know that women have to. Um, put up with that um, way too frequently. Um, and it's something that I'm, I'm still like shocked by uh, because I don't have to deal with that. Um, and so this, whenever I experience it, it's still shocking to me. But then I talk to my, my friends, my women friends, and I'm like, oh yeah, this is just another night out. Right. It's just what, what happens? I'm like, God, fuck. I'm so like, I'm sorry. You guys are dicks. What the hell? Oh. And I just, so, so, yeah. so that's why like, I'm constantly trying to, um, you know, just like, uh, learn as like, what is the best thing for me to do in these situations, but also to el educate other men yeah. as in just like, what do you do in these situations? But also, don't like because this guy she knew him kind of and i like looked him up and like man we have 30 mutual friends on instagram i was so close to be to like dming every one of my friends and be like yo steer clear of this dude he's <laughs> like he's not cool yeah. um but i don't know and it, and it's like i think this is like because we don't have hr departments and mm -hmm. the only re recourse we have it seemingly is like public shaming and that's just kind of you know is what it's it's become as um which is I you're not going to public yeah. the way that we can divert that a little bit is is kind of what you did that night i what i tell a lot of my guy friends is the way that they can help is to just speak up in the situation and even if they're not 100% confident that it is crossing a line, if it feels like it might be crossing a line, it's better to be wrong and have the other person involved say, no, I'm fine with what's going on, than mm -hmm. to make the mistake of completely missing that some bad behavior is happening. So right. mm -hmm. it's just really important. And it makes a big difference when there is another voice in the room that says, hey, that's not cool. Mm. That it's so simple, but it is incredibly effective. Okay, cool. Um, great. Yeah, that's helpful. I mean, in the in the nightclub scene, um, I mean, I read your uh, your billboard interview um, and uh, about that, um, and I encourage everybody to go to go read this this billboard interview um, where you discuss kind of you you, you said. Um, women in nightclubs are product uh, mm -hmm. because they stuff the, the, you know, women get in free and they stuff the clubs with, with women and, and there's women walking around in skimpy dresses, serving drinks. And, and that's how kind of women are positioned in the nightclubs. Mm -hmm. So when you 
are uh, a DJ and already the staff and the patrons kind of have that training where they see, oh, this is how we treat women in these environments. Mm -hmm. Um, Have you noticed that that has shifted over the years? Has it gotten better? Is it changing at all? Or do you still see the same things now as we did 10 or 20 years ago? In terms of how clubs are staffed, it's exactly the same. They're, I don't see much variance there. I really wish that there would be because I would not mind a hot dude go-go dancer every once in a while. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in terms of the, the division of, of work, I would say it's relatively the same. And do you feel um, how you're treated uh, as the DJ? Has that shifted at all? Or? That has shifted, yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. I think, especially now, maybe my position is a little bit different because I am more of a public figure, mm-hmm. but I definitely have noticed there being a tangible shift in the way I am treated personally, wherever it is that I'm performing. Actually, oh my gosh, no, that's not true. I just had an interaction three weeks ago and then my brain shelved it. That's crazy. Oh um, gosh. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> I was, I was playing a, a gig and I, I don't really want to say where, just out of courtesy of the fact that I am currently in conversation with the people that were throwing the event. Sure. But there was, I wanted to get a photo on the stage because there were these great LED screens and it just would it would, was going to pop with the outfit I had on. So after my performance, yeah. and once they cleared everything off, I asked the front of house group if anything else was scheduled. They said no. So I was like, great, I'm going to go up and take the photo. And as I went up, a celebrity came out on stage and I did not know that was going to happen because I was already given clearance from front of house and they were doing a meet and greet. So I just dropped my bag and thought, cool, I'll just wait this out until they complete their thing. And then I'll go up and take the photo. And very immediately the show producer, who was also somebody that was on the email chain while I was being booked, had had phone conversations with me, was the person I checked in with every morning ran up to me and said, you're not allowed to be here. This is private. You need to go and grab me by both of my elbows, flung me around and shoved me away from the stage. Holy shit. Yeah. It was crazy. It without any conversation, nothing. It went from, it was zero to a hundred real quick. And it just did not need to be that way. He Mm -hmm. could have just said, could you wait in the back? We're doing a meet and greet. Right. And I'll know when the stage is available. That's it. That's literally all that had to happen. But instead, it escalated and he physically touched me nice. and shoved me away from the stage. Wow. This was the promoter or the security? Uh, promoter. Pro- the promoter. Mm-hmm. Wow. That. That's... Uh, so, I mean, what do you do in that situation when that uh, happens? It was, it was so strange because I remember afterward really being disappointed in myself because I stand for uh, equal rights and for people being able to say their piece in the moment and not be held uh, accountable for things that might rock the boat if it's the right thing to say. And I was so shocked that that had happened. I just walked away and I just let it be because then very immediately this person was in discussions with other people that were helming the event who were also of equal importance. And I just didn't want to appear problematic. And so I thought, well, I'll just write an email later, <laughs> mm-hmm. which I did. Yeah. I, I mean, were, did anybody acknowledge that mm-hmm. that was wrong and, and did they apologize? Yeah. I had, I had a friend with, who just, happened to be there, did not know that I was going to be performing. I did not know they were going to be there. And they witnessed it. And they said that it took pretty much every fiber in their being to not say anything. Mm-hmm. But it was it was a guy friend of mine. And also for him, he was very shocked. And he was like, wow, this is, for me, the first glimpse I've had into perhaps what you deal with. Because I think that if you were a dude, that probably wouldn't have happened. Right. And right. he felt that it was very egregious as well. Now, when I emailed the company, the other person who I'd been dealing with said he was very sorry for the behavior and he would get to the bottom of it. And I haven't, I haven't discussed the matter since. So I haven't gotten a formal apology from the person that actually did that. 
Sure. Man, um, how often are you uh, DJing these days? You know, it's probably every few weeks. Okay. I'm lucky enough to be in a position where I don't really have to seek work out. So I just get what comes my way and make a determination as to what is worth my time and sure. um, high profile enough, I guess. And yeah. So I, I'm very... I'm very lucky in that way because for many years it was, it was a total grind to try and find gigs every single week that play for a few hundred dollars a piece. Mm-hmm. And probably they're in multi-hour, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, yeah, it's a very, it's a very different world now. And I, I definitely don't take it for granted. So for younger uh, DJs, producers who are looking to kind of break into the live club world, the scene to, to get hired, uh, who are just kind of starting off. Um, what advice can you offer them to, to break into that scene, maybe in their local markets or, or elsewhere? I mean, honestly, I think you'll probably agree with me and I'll see you nod your head in a second, but first and foremost, the answer is networking, okay. right? Especially if you're talking about a local level, trying to get those residency gigs, it's very, very tough. There's a lot of people that are competing for that opening slot or that closing slot. And oftentimes there's just the bank of people that the promoter will just use over and over again because they're reliable, they know the format, they know the night, they know the club, they know Mm -hmm. what's going to work, how to set up for the headliner, et cetera. And so really it's about building relationships with the people that do those bookings to convince them that they need to take a chance on you. And how do you go about, well, one, meeting or learning who these people are and then meeting them and then how do you convince them to take a chance on you? <laughs> totally. <laughs> Absolutely. That, that is the gold star question, right? Uh-huh. But <laughs> I think part of it is obviously knowing people that are in the same line of work as you, right? So if you have friends okay. that are DJs that have those opening slots and mm-hmm. you trust them to make an introduction or you say, hey, you know, if I go out and see you, would you be willing to uh, introduce me to the talent buyer or to the GM? And then you just have a casual conversation um, and just make sure that you keep up with them, show face. You know, the more times somebody sees you, the more they know that you're actually interested in, in getting that opportunity. And, you know, sometimes I would be friends with the artist that was headlining and I would just ask the artist if they would put in the request to have me as support. Mm. And, that worked as well. Nice. Yeah. So in the DJ world, how do you, uh, because it's so much about the live experience, mm-hmm. uh, is there a digital calling card that you basically could send a promoter or even just to, to new friends or others in the scene to kind of show what you can do? I mean, would that just be kind of a, a link to your, like a SoundCloud, like 30 minute kind of set, remix, something like that? Or, or what, what does that look like? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it would be, it would be SoundCloud, be MixCloud. A lot of people are going to MixCloud now. Okay, MixCloud. Yeah, um, SoundCloud. It just it depends on whether your stuff's going to get flagged by the algorithm. It's still, <laughs> right. it's not entirely friendly for DJ mixes. They, sure. they have their partnership with Dubset, and Dubset, bless their hearts, they're doing an amazing job on trying to bridge that gap with gray area material, but it's still mm-hmm. not perfect. I do believe that Apple Music also supports DJ mixes through Dubset now. But right. Yeah, Dubset is striking these uh, partnerships. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know mm-hmm. if that's open for everyone or if it's just something they're testing out. Yeah. But yeah, the, the digital calling card, as it were, would would be mixes and then just a centralized website. Although I see more and more often that the centralized website is really just a container for everybody's social media accounts. Mm. Yeah. How important do you find um, Instagram and kind of your uh, Instagram profile? It's everything. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, everything. <laughs> right. It's everything. Oh my gosh. Especially, especially if you're if you do corporate events. A lot of the times, okay, I I've done several corporate events this year, and I love them because the partnerships that I do, I do because I believe in the message that the brand is offering, not because I'm like, cool, free product. Um, But what I've seen has been a very different shift. So normally they would just say, you know, if you post after the fact, that's great. 
but it's not required on your part. We're booking you, we're paying a fee, you show up, you do your job, and that's it. And now I'm, there was one gig I did where they sent me an Excel spreadsheet afterward, and I had to fill out all of my metrics for every single story frame that I posted prior to the event, and also all of the metrics for the post on my timeline that advertised the event. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. And so that's what brands are, are really focusing on these days. And so are you, uh, are you finding that you're getting, and in your peers in the space, are getting more kind of branded, uh, I guess, well, corporate events that you're hired to play, but it's equally you're hired to play the event, but also promote on your socials, on, on Instagram specifically? Yeah. The, the request... 100% of the time has been out of Instagram. They're not very, they haven't been very concerned about other platforms. If I post okay. on Twitter or Facebook, it's nice, but yeah, yeah they're, they're some truly focused on Instagram. And what are some tips that you can give artists? Uh, because I, I do find a lot of artists say, well, it should all, you know, it's just about the music or it's all about the music or it should just be about that. And um, there's a lot I mean, of shoulds in the music industry, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it's um, an industry. It's a job. Yeah. It's a profession. There's all this yeah. stuff that surrounds the creative part. I mean, that's the point of it. You know, mm -hmm. any any job that you have, there's stuff that you don't want to deal with that surrounds the lovely bits, right? Mm -hmm. It's not. <laughs> it's not all flowers and unicorns and puppy dogs all the time. <laughs> right. I, it, it's wonderful when you actually get to that point and you're performing and you're on stage, but yeah, there's the business end of it. Mm -hmm. And, and Instagram is, is become a like major part of that, if not the mm -hmm. biggest driver of, uh, of the business and, and part of your digital calling card. I mean, mm -hmm. that's kind of a representation of your, uh, your artist brand and who you yep. are. And, and most people are getting the glimpse into your artist world by just going yep. to your Instagram. And so it's, it, it has to, so you know. wild because I watched this interview with Will Smith of all people on mm -hmm. the daily show. It was maybe a week or two ago. And he's one of the celebrities that has gone all in on being fully exposed on all the social media networks. You get to know what Will Smith is like at home when he goes to the doctors, like everything. And he's on Insta, YouTube, anywhere that he can be, he, he is on it. And he said that the reason why he made that decision was that when he started out in movies, you didn't want to expose too much. And that was the driving force to get people to go to the theater. There was that mystique surrounding people. And so the, the access that they got was when they saw the film, when they actually went to the theater. But now, because there's the expectation to know everything about the artist and we have the visibility and there is this transparency, or I guess curated transparency, because what you see online is not necessarily the truth, sure. then there is the expectation that you get the music, but then the driving force is also that you feel a connectedness to the actual artist, no matter how big they are. And feel personal connection to their life. Right. It's uh, I, I have noticed that shift in, in Will Smith. He, he's been teaming up with uh, with influencers, if you you know, if you will, like and the uh, mm -hmm. former Viners, like I know uh, King Batch, and he did a few videos together and like little skits and, and those kinds of things. Um, so smart. Yeah, it's great. I mean, it's that's just the evolution of media right now, and mm -hmm. it you know you kind of have to jump on board with that or you'll be left behind, uh, at least in that realm. Um, super interesting. So I want to, um, you've been writing a lot about and, and doing uh, for the last year, year and a half or so, talking a lot about AI in music, um, artificial oh intelligence. Gosh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the only reason why I'm laughing is just because it's, it's not like I started out saying this is going to be the hill that I die on in 2019. But <laughs> I couldn't escape the topic. It kept popping up and it kept being something that I had to contend with. Yeah. And then the more I saw people talking about it, the more curious I got. And I'm lucky enough to have a lot of friends that are also lawyers. And so they put up with my phone calls, which they have to do all the time. <laughs> right. Uh, which, when I see laws being proposed or people having discussions and I'm just mm -hmm. naturally curious and I want to know what the end result is going to be or yeah. what the potential end result could be because 
you know, if anyone thinks that AI is not going to be a permanent part of our future in music, for anything. Yeah. Uh, right. So I, I've, I've read a lot about it. Uh, I mean, your articles and, and watched the video with my friend, Taryn Southern. Um, mm-hmm. I remember when she released that, that album um, last year, I believe, and mm-hmm. she kind of hit me up about it. And I, I still don't quite grasp what AI music is. Can you explain just in like super, super, super basic terms, uh, like what AI music is and how it works? Ooh. This is where I get to flex my verge muscles. <laughs> yes. Dude, explain like I'm five. Yes, so please. AI music takes all sorts of forms. AI is really, a lot of people confuse algorithms and machine learning and AI. AI mm. is basically machine learning that is trained enough to execute a decision. So it is, right. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. If, it, if it can't make a decision on its own, it's not an AI. Um, so with some of the platforms that Taryn was using, she would give it parameters, but then it was making decisions to give her an output that she could work with. So platforms like Amper or with Google Magenta or IBM Watson, you, you feed it material, you're giving it a set of parameters, but then it makes choices with what it gives back to you. That's so freaky. I mean, I, I kind of, I, 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 can understand it conceptually when we're talking about mm-hmm. like a uh, a little robot, uh, like what what's her what's her name the that robot that's uh, the one that that talks uh, that you There's can so have many conversations of them. with. I, oh my gosh! Are like, there really? Oh no! Yeah, <laughs> oh like, gosh! Home. That's uh, what it is. Of course. Oh <laughs> gosh! In your home, you can have a conversation with. Oh man, it's just yes. Um, but with music, what do you mean makes a decision? So it's like we're going to put the chorus here, or actually instead, uh, I, I'm feeling that because so much right. Is, I mean, you're, how you're does it exactly feel? Exactly right. You're exactly yeah. right because depending on the the material that it's fed, yeah. that that changes the algorithm, the AI over time, right? So right. if you fed it. Uh, the same song 10 different times, it might not give you the same output 10 different times. Oh, okay. Because every time you feed it something, you're uh-huh. training it to act a little differently. Every mm. time you tell it, I like something or I don't like something, it's informing the choices that it's going to make for you. And so there's, the, but it's very, it's a very black and white thing because to talk about music AI as um, a thing that spits out a melody. I think that that's like a very easy way to think about it, but Mm -hmm. AI is being used in all aspects of music. Like think about mastering, right? Lander, a lot of people use that. Mm -hmm. That's AI. You feed it a song and it makes a determination on how to best boost it to make it sound like it's been mastered by a human being it's not applying the same thing to every single song it's listening to the input and analyzing it and then making choices yeah no yeah totally and then um in in terms of the how people are using it like taryn but others and, and where you think it's it's going to be used more um i would say i guess just just more frequently um is it and everything everything like everything so the b i mean the creating like even songwriting like creating melodies uh oh, yeah. the chord, there are apps that do that right lyrics. now yes there are apps that do that <laughs> so what you're I'm, saying I'm so is sorry. all songwriters are going to be replaced <laughs> in about 10 years there okay. will be no more songwriters <laughs> okay look, I'm, i i i am so Sweet. aware and have such compassion for songwriters because uh-huh. i i really truly believe that they can get get the short end of the stick when we talk about compensation uh, when it comes to songs mm-hmm. in general. But I do not think that AI is going to replace all songwriters or that it's going to replace all session musicians. I think that it might take away a couple of jobs if someone doesn't have the funds to hire a singer or a songwriter and they live in, I don't know, a rural area, right? And they're just starting out and have access to a studio and that might be an easier option, but it's not, it's not great right now, 
the options that we do have, I do think they're going to rapidly get a lot better. There is a, an AI vocal that just came out probably today or yesterday. That's supposed to be the closest that we have to a human voice. Oh my gosh. I'm, I'm so sorry to bring this oh, up. Oh no. <laughs> I was just talking, um, to uh to do the ultimate name drop of name drops um last night i was at this uh event honoring quincy jones and i mm. had the extreme honor of of chatting with him for a little while and he said which I, I, now in this conversation right now it is hitting me in such a different way than it hit me last night when it <laughs> floored me also but he said uh a song cannot be more or less human than you are. That's right. Mm -hmm. And now with AI, <laughs> when, there's song, when, when the creator of that song isn't human at all, I'm curious in the sense that if people are going to resonate with it in the same way, I mean, I guess the way that people resonate with pop, we mm -hmm. have to understand is so drastically different than the way people resonate with folk mm -hmm. or with... Uh, conscious hip hop, mm -hmm. um, you know, or with, uh, soul. Yep. And so I think I, I personally, I don't think that AI is going to be able to evolve into a place where it will have the same emotional impact mm -hmm. that some of the greatest, uh, folk or Americana or soul or mm -hmm. hip hop artists can have because that is it's so inherently human mm -hmm. what they are providing is those human emotions and yes and relaying real experiences like the the human experience um but with pop i, I get it you know and i was watching your interview with, with charlie xcx mm -hmm. and she was even saying when i'm writing a song for somebody else mm -hmm. uh i kind of take myself out of it and it's totally formulaic i'm gonna put, mm -hmm. i'm gonna front load it with the hooks and the chorus and all of that stuff and it was almost like she was the machine yes absolutely <laughs> Yeah. And and here's where I'm gonna uh, pop your bubble once again, just slightly. <laughs> but the thing the thing that AI is actually best at replicating, and uh, one of the genres is best at is folk music. What? Yeah. How so? But yeah. Folk ah no. <laughs> Google um, artificial intelligence Irish folk music. Oh They're gosh. Oh, but okay. I do I do also because it's so rule based, traditional. Mm. But I sure. do, I do think country. I could see, yes, yes, yeah. I I do think that um, so far, I don't want to make any predictions about where AI will go. But I think AI is fine for creating background music in a commercial. It's sure. great if I need if I'm making a YouTube video and I need something to fill up dead air behind me. But people aren't going to be paying attention to it, right? Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. great for uh, even generative dance music. There's an app called Mubert or Mubert, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, M-U-B-E-R-T. And I can leave it on a preset like techno or house or lo-fi, and it will just invent it on the fly forever. And it sounds pretty good, actually. Wow. Yeah. Um, but is, it, is that a, a hit song that is going to resonate with people and stay with them for the rest of their lives? No, it's not. But it's something right. that's fine to sit in the background. And that, you, that's where I find most of it is. Or it's like okay. a helper. It's a really good AI is, here's the thing too. AI is a great helper for musicians. It's and great that's for- that's how Taryn used it for her album. Yes, it's great for right. starting ideas. It's great for finishing projects. I mean, even Isotope has an AI component in its mastering suite, hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, Apple has AI built into its drummer function. Sure, sure. Right? Wow, yeah, yeah. I mean, people, people don't think about it, but- when you're in logic and you're painting in the drums, what do you think is doing that for you? Right, right. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so do you think that uh, AI will kind of take over the live DJ space? Mm -mm. And why not? I think our competition has always been the radio. Um, DJs have had competition just based on the nature of what we do since mm -hmm. the moment DJing was started. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's still a contingency of you just press buttons, right? I mean, that's what the, <laughs> right. we've, we've had to fight a contingency to, to prove our worth as artists ever mm -hmm. since the term DJing was invented. And so right. um, am I 
scared about AI taking over my job. Uh, you know, not not as much as I am about, um, yeah. I mean, putting on a mix, right? Mm -hmm. Some places they just put on a mix. Well, I'm curious about uh, like when I saw Marshmallow. Uh, mm -hmm. for the first time. And this was like before the, you know, people still were, were uh, unsure of his identity. And, and that was kind of the mystique. And uh, that was the um, part of the appeal. And I'm like, okay, it could be anyone up there mm -hmm. underneath this big helmet. And so smart. So smart. But, and I'm thinking like, well, why doesn't he just make, like, just, just hire about, you know, five, six, 10 other skinny dudes to like go around the world and simultaneously do the marshmallow set if he can like train them and they can be his minions and like he can mentor these people and just like, you know, dance. How do we know that like isn't it. already happening or that's not it the plan? Very well could be. I, <laughs> <laughs> so, but then I'm thinking like, well, as robots get better as AI robots and they can start moving and dancing and you can program them and train them to do mm -hmm. a similar kind of set uh, and train them to do the same kinds of things that DJs do, mm -hmm. why couldn't that take over the space? Are we talking about a physical robot? Is that what you're like talking Like a physical, about? yes, a physical robot that does that. Oh, you're physically. going full Terminator on me. I'm uh, going full Terminator. We're already, we're like getting there. This is going to happen <laughs> yeah. in our lifetime. <laughs> China and DJ. Um, yeah, China and DJ, right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, there's already been a robot DJ. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> in asia it's actually the videos are actually pretty fun to watch it's uh I it doesn't like seen that. Yeah. yeah it doesn't look like a human it it looks very industrial but it actually mm. does go through the trouble of selecting cds and putting them in the cdjs and beat matching and pressing the buttons and everything wow wow yeah, it's so, so crazy there we go it's happening yeah. it's already happening but there is there is a diff <laughs> there is a, ultimately i think what like what quincy said resonates with all artistic output so there's a difference between a, a robot that is that can technically execute the job and then a performer someone mm -hmm. like like a marshmallow or like a steve aoki um mm -hmm. or an eric pritz that is able to feed off of the audience and have that je ne sais quoi of just being human and being in the moment and being able to react to what the audience is reacting to on the fly mm -hmm. and it's that intangible connection that happens between the audience and the artist that can't be replicated. Yes, that is that that um, almost the spiritual component of mm -hmm. it, and it's yes. tapping into that higher consciousness mm -hmm. that we haven't been. We robots can't do that yet. Yes. <laughs> Hopefully, ever. I feel like that's 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 such a human element is mm -hmm. is the consciousness right and uh, and and just being able to tap into that collective energy of the room and mm -hmm. riding that wave and that's you know the greatest djs and the greatest performers uh in any genre are able to do that mm -hmm. and uh and the best ones can guide that energy exactly uh, right so. it's really interesting because there's i feel like music is um with ai a little harder for it to grasp than maybe art so it, there are plenty of ais that can create abstract art um mm -hmm. music it's still learning how to be adequate at a lot of them at least mm -hmm. they they think that the written word is going to be the last bastion that for mm -hmm. ai to be able to conquer but art it's like it's pretty good at visual art sometimes there was there was this one study well not really a study but more of a social experiment where there was a gallery and they put up AI made art and they tested how people reacted to it when they didn't know it was made by a machine versus after they knew it was made by a machine. Mm -hmm. And people actually, the, the split, I think beforehand, much more of people, the majority of people that were present felt like they identified with the art or they felt positively toward it. And then that number was halved when they learned that it was made by a machine. So just knowing that it was made by a machine made a massive difference in how people responded to the art. Mm. I mean, that makes sense because mm -hmm. art is, uh, we're trying to find uh, the inner truth uh, behind the piece of art. And it's, uh, that's the kind of the, 
the what we're seeking, I think what most people are seeking with, with art in, in any form and through any medium is to find the truth or, or see if it can reveal more truths about ourselves. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it, it is revealing a certain truth that <laughs> uh, even though it was created uh, by a machine, um, it's, it's kind of that. It's, it's interesting because it, then it's, it's, well, do you feel negatively because you you have a bias toward things that are made by machines or do you feel negatively now because you felt tricked? Duped. Right. Exactly. Right. You were tricked. Right. Uh, I mean, probably a little bit of both. Um, more so you felt tricked. Um, but, but yes, I mean, <laughs> I don't think I would, uh, knowing something maybe from the get-go is machine made i just inherently would feel less connected to it just knowing Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. um and that's why you know the story behind the music is uh always so important and that's people connect to songs and to artists so much on such a deeper level Mm -hmm. once they know the story behind the song and the story behind the artist And and can i say that that is exactly why the future of where things are going kind of scares me a little bit for people that are starting out Because it used to be that you could tell the story with the packaging and the visuals and all the stuff that came along with the music when it was released, right? Mm -hmm. But most music discovery is gravitating toward voice commands, right? So if if you're talking to your Alexa or your Google Home or Siri or whatever it is that you use to listen to your Spotify or Apple Music or your DSP of choice, then very likely you're saying, you know, put on some music I can cook to, put on something relaxing, right? Mm -hmm. Then maybe you don't even know what the artist is, right? Because context listening is the trend right now, not requesting Mm -hmm. for a specific artist or even a specific genre, but the Mm -hmm. mood that you're in. So then Mm -hmm. it starts to play you a whole bunch of stuff, but it exists in a vacuum. There's no context around it. it. It plays a whole bunch of stuff. You passively listen to it. Maybe something caught your attention, but, um, you know, you're doing something. So the moment passes. Mm-hmm. So I think it's going to be, it's going to be difficult once the majority of discovery happens with voice for newer artists to figure out how to stand out. Well, I feel like it's, it's kind of um, pop radio has pretty much been that way for a while in the sense that the, the commodity is pop radio. Like people mm-hmm. would always tune in to, pop radio because they like pop radio, not necessarily because they like a certain artist. Um, It was just that became the commodity that became what they liked was pop radio. And now it, you know, then evolved into playlists. And similarly, we have the mood playlists Mm -hmm. now, which is driving so much. And and more times than not, we're seeing artists that get millions of streams on Spotify that can't draw 50 people to their shows locally. Absolutely. Because they get included on all of these playlists and people yes. don't even know who the artists are on the playlists. Right. Um, and so that's the tricky thing right now is, is you know, leveraging the, the streams and maybe the money you're getting from the streams to help communi- to just help find your audience and, mm-hmm. and attract them in a way. And it's, it's such an interesting disconnect right now is that you could get millions of streams and still not have any fans. Um, yes. Conversely, you could get a hundred thousand streams and find out a really nice B market tour at a five hundred cap room. And right. Yeah. 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 That's absolutely. Totally okay for yourself. But yes. I would still argue that pop radio is different from context playlist listening, just because the rotation of songs that happens with pop radio is so much more condensed. Right. There's there's um you know that a Cardi B song is going to be playing at least once every hour. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, there, are, there are certain things that are going to be put in front of you and that list is very short. It's like, it is like New Music Friday, but just mm. on repeat every single hour. Right, right. 24 true. hours a day. So, you know, that's that's why radio becomes so important for a lot of artists because that mm-hmm. space is still so incredibly finite versus sure. if you're at home and you're just requesting a, a mood. Right. What does that even mean? It's different... <laughs> It's different according to every single person's individual profile and their listening history and the devices yep. they have probably um, and the company's AI. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. I mean, Pandora kind of um, were, was the first to customize, mm-hmm. uh, you know, per user. And Spotify is moving in that realm mm-hmm. uh, with much more of their algorithmically generated playlists um, and kind of uh, taking, fortunately, luckily, I, I th- taking the power away from the uh, playlist editors, which they've been in the last five years have been like the most powerful people in music, mm-hmm. uh, the Spotify playlist editors. And so now we're moving towards more customized, uh, individually customized playlists based on oh, that's algorithms. That's really interesting. So you think that the playlist curators are not a good thing? Uh, I think that they become too powerful. Mm. I think that the playlist editors, the curators uh, at Spotify, they became the new radio DJs and they became way too powerful. And it was kind of like if you had an in with them, you could uh, skyrocket tomorrow. Uh, I, I saw this through friends. It's like, oh yeah, you know, this one, one guy at Spotify loves me. And so now I have 50 million streams and like, is his music that much better than this other artist who doesn't have the in at Spotify? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I was, and then I was also seeing, you know, there's, it, there's payola that happens um, with with editors and it's not illegal because it's not radio and it's Spotify. And so you're seeing the, you know, the editors being flown out to um, lavish parties and vacations mm-hmm. and you're seeing, you know, um, just them being treated. And they're, they're the most, for a time and still for the most part, uh, you know, the most valuable people in music. And so I don't, I don't like that because mm-hmm. there's so much it's just too much power for just a small mm. select group of people. Mm-hmm. And it's just like the, the radio DJs back in the day. Um, and so I actually prefer if we move towards individualized, customized algorithms mm. uh, based on the, the user's tastes mm-hmm. and preferences because it's almost democratiz- democratizing uh, just the the power and, and the music overall. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Spotify got a little queasy with how it was going over the last few years that that their editors um you know they they're not dumb they knew that their editors were uh being treated uh, like royalty and mm-hmm. so they kind of put up these walls and now uh, over the last year unless you're a major uh mm-hmm. they've really like put up the blockades with all the distributors the managers i mean it's kind of like yeah they they guard their playlist editors now um like the queen sure. of england like they're just not um, allowing the access anymore because they realize how powerful they got. And I, I hope they move Paola more. happens on a, on a more micro level with the third-party playlisters. There oh, are, even more so. Yes. Yeah. There, there are Absolutely. companies where you hire them to execute a marketing campaign. They say, give yes. us ten, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000. And then mm-hmm. they go out to all these playlisters and the playlisters won't even listen to your song unless they're given 10 or 15 bucks. Absolutely. Oh yeah, I, I I did a review on a playlist push, um, and I, I reviewed it from both sides as an artist submitting music, and mm-hmm. then as a curator because I have a playlist, um, and then getting paid to listen to this stuff. Mm. And I, um, it was funny because initially as an artist submitting, I'm like, oh, this is really interesting, and I got included on all these playlists. But then um, I, as a curator on the other end. I was getting sent all of these songs that had nothing to do with the playlist, even though I like selected the the kind of the genres. I'm like, I don't feel comfortable taking this money from these artists because they, I should not be getting sent these songs. And, uh, and so I wrote about that and I, I, you know, I only did the, uh, for like a month just to kind of test it out and be able to write the piece. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not, I don't really stand by this practice and I, um, I don't, and, and in the end, it, it kind of has evolved over the last two years uh, when they kind of got started, where I don't think it's actually as effective as it once was. Um, mm-hmm. The space got flooded. And to be honest, the last song that we submitted totally messed up our fans also like uh, because they put a, like they put the song on playlists that had nothing to do with uh, with the, the song itself. And it was like it was, it was a, a funk song that got put on like uh, an Avril Lavigne and Pink playlist. I'm like, this is not even in the realm. This is not not even close. And But they did that because the playlisters make more money if they include the song on the playlist. And so it's this whole economy um, and this whole, uh, 
you know, industry now. Mm -hmm. And I, I think gig it's, economy, man. <laughs> yeah, it's the gig economy. That's for sure. I mean, there's play, I mean, George who runs playlists, but she was, the, he straight up told me, he's like, Oh yeah. Uh, we have some playlisters who have paid off their college debt, their student debt because, wow. of, because of this, like legitimately I'm <laughs> like, okay, that's cool. But like, I'm talking to all these artists who feel like they've wasted thousands of dollars on right. playlist push campaigns and nothing came of it. Or worse, uh, it messed up the algorithm. So now Spotify is confused at mm. uh, how to recommend their songs because they're getting all of these streams from people who like Avril Lavigne and Pink because they listen to those playlists and their songs aren't like that at all. And so now they have no hope in in greater discovery through the Spotify algorithms because these playlist campaigns have royally messed up uh, the reach and the algorithm. And I so, did not even consider that. Yeah. yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> totally. So, you know, and this is, this is where we're at. And this is how it's just like, it, it's, and it's constantly evolving. Like this stuff didn't exist three years ago. Right. Um, but, but yeah, so that's why I, I feel like, the 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 editorial playlists um in any realm i think are i'm i'm hoping we get to a point where it's more more algorithmic that's uh, really interesting though that you i think you place um more weight and importance on certain creative output that that can only be done by humans but i think some people would also argue that curating the right playlist which is sort of DJing mm -hmm. is is something that could be uniquely human as well. If I listen to something, I would know that there's a certain, oh, this sounds like uh, the Black Madonna. Um, mm -hmm. This sounds like an Adam Bayer mix, right? Um, mm -hmm. This sounds like Anna. This, yeah. This sounds like Paul Van Dyke. Right. Right. So I, mean, I, I just I, think, I think yeah. it's interesting that there are certain things that you inherently place more value on. Mm -hmm. with and like what you maybe consider to be a creative decision that is worth yes. well and that is interesting and it's probably my my uh musical upbringing and background is I, i'm not a dj i didn't grow up in that in that realm uh, i never went to raves i uh and i and i don't have much experience in um like in that kind of uh, realm and so it's kind of as a songwriter as a singer songwriter right i was aghast <laughs> to hear about how uh, machines are, are writing but when you're like oh curate the playlist let a machine do that easy right yeah. <laughs> i mean so shoot spotify already <laughs> has algorithms in place that will transition from one song to the next right i mean it's not mm -hmm. it's not mm -hmm. great i think i can dj by spotify's algorithm <laughs> i hope so <laughs> but, but there are some but. there are some apps like um dj dj pro 2 i think mm. where the the system is actually really freaking good at choosing the next song for me and transitioning and we'll even do fancy stuff like a backspin wow. it'll imitate that or like an echo out um and I don't really, I don't feel like my job is in danger because of it. Like mm -hmm. if I had a house party and I wanted some uninterrupted music to play in the background, I mm -hmm. might use that tool. Mm. Yeah. Wow. So Even as a DJ, that's, you wouldn't, yeah, you wouldn't sure. be your friend. Yeah. All right. <laughs> True. No, no I, I want my friends to be partying with me. Of but, course. Of course. Like, well, let's define the size of the house party. But if I had like yeah. 10 people over at my house, yes. I would, right, I would you're not, that'd be awkward to have a DJ in the corner. But uh, <laughs> right, if you're doing a, <laughs> a big rager, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, but yeah, sense. I mean, you know, curating, curating in its own right has been such a staple and cornerstone of the music industry for so long, for decades, right? I mean, we value curatorial yes. opinion, right? Yes. We value people who we think have a better ear than others or are able to articulate why a piece of work is important or not. Or, mm -hmm. you know, there, there are times when you listen to a playlist and there's one song that feels very jarring coming mm -hmm. after the heels of, of another song. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. one song ends with a nice trail off into silence and all of a sudden the next song starts with like a very strong raucous kick drum and a vocal that's very harsh. And then yep. that that's feel nice, right? So mm -hmm. there, there's a definite art to the order of songs and the type of songs that you pick and 
and this is the ELI five of DJing <laughs> minus the crowd. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I do appreciate a, uh, a good curation and I, I look to like KCRW for instance, I love, you know, uh, certain DJs on there and their sets that they do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll even find some of them on, on, um, you know, if they put them up on Mixcloud or SoundCloud or something like that. Um, and I'll tune into their shows and, and I do appreciate that. And I, and, and I've curated a playlist, um, myself on Spotify that I take great pride in. And I, and I did organize it. You know, I, I put as much care into the order of the playlist mm-hmm. that I did for the literal, physical mix cassette tape that I made my girlfriend in middle school. Absolutely. Like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Like I, I really spent time with it. Um, so I, I do appreciate it and I understand it. But I think where I just, where my hesitation so is. I think you don't like the idea of there being singular gatekeepers. Yes, that's exactly it. That's it. Yeah. And that's, mm-hmm. that's where, uh, that's where it completely lies. And, and I don't like how the industry of, of it all, uh, the playlisting industry has evolved into the sense where these gatekeepers have become so insanely powerful that it's like they can make or break your career. Mm-hmm. And I just, the gatekeepers I, have always had the power to make or break someone's career. It's just, where do the gatekeepers lie? And at least true. now I will say we have more gatekeepers than ever, which could actually be a positive because you could be pretty popular on one platform and not necessarily have to break another platform in order to engender an audience. Totally. Totally. Yes. So we're all, we have gatekeepers still, however, because there's just so many more of them, it's not so concentrated. It's not like the one, it's not like the K rock DJ. It's like, you have to get in with them. If you're a rock band in, you know, the Uh nineties and if you don't get in with them, like you're not going to be successful. Yeah. Um, so yeah. that that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I think that. So, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so no, <laughs> no, it's fantastic. It's, it's, it's so interesting. I mean, it just because, um, yeah, I don't, I guess most of the people that I, I talk to in music are within my realm. So it's very mm-hmm. interesting to have a nuanced discussion about values and importance with certain kinds of outputs or work with someone that is in a completely different genre than what I normally operate in. Yeah. That's, ditto. That's very- Likewise. <laughs> For sure. Um, so uh, real quick, I, I, um, you're the recording Academy vice president of Chicago. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? Yes. What is, what does that title do? What is, what does that mean? So- what is that role? Are you a member, Ari? No, I'm not. <gasps> you probably would... haven't. You probably have enough songwriting credits to be a member. Okay, so well, let's let's talk about that. What does it take to be a member, and why should somebody be a member? And okay. what is? Let's just start off with what is the Recording Academy? The Recording Academy is a a network of uh, full time musicians across the United States, but you might more formally know it as the entity that puts on the fancy Grammy show every year. Right. And really it's, it's a nonprofit that is, the headquarters is is in Santa Monica. There is a a full-time staff, but a lot of the rules and decision-making and the uh, support and the decisions are made are fully uh, carried out and dictated by our members, which are represented by chapters all over the U.S. So there's an L.A. chapter, a New York chapter, a Florida chapter, and I am the VP of the Chicago chapter, which is really the Midwest chapter because we oversee the members in 12 Midwest states. Hmm. So Minneapolis falls under our purview as is Detroit and Indianapolis and all these other amazing, important cities that contributed to the wealth of music history that comes out of this region. Mm-hmm. Um, and so part, part of what I do being on the board is with my position uniquely, I help to create events throughout the year that are meant to be just really cool resources and spaces of creativity for our existing members to connect. But we also use those spaces to invite a few folks that we think might be good candidates to come into the academy. So there was one that just happened a few nights ago, literally two blocks from my house. And I didn't even know the 
recording studio was there and I've lived here for seven years. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. And, and it was just, it was for the producers and engineers wing. It was just about 20 people, probably all members. And there were eight people that made a presentation and they just played a, a mix that they had done, um, a final mix down um, or a master that they had done and shared their thoughts behind the decisions that they made through the process and invited feedback. And there's a dialogue after everyone played their work. So it's, it's just a very cool way to, in real life, connect with the other people that are a part of the community and, mm. and provide creative space for, for you to show off your work and to maybe get some feedback and, and critique. So there's one event that I'm working on that I think might happen in February that's just going to be for women that are in the P&E, that's the producers and engineers wing. Mm-hmm. So we're gonna we're looking at a few women who are high profile producers and engineers, and we'll have one mm-hmm. of them come in and sort of lead the session. And then mm-hmm. we'll have we're gonna invite only women in our chapter with the PE credits to come, and everyone sort of similarly will share the project of their choice, and then we'll have a discussion about the, the decisions that you made and why you did the things that you did, and you know yeah. what plugins did you use and um, what was your choice with chaining things like that, and um, and hopefully the the celebrity engineer will then also share a project. Mm. Cool. Mm-hmm. Um, speaking of of women producers and engineers, did you see my article, my Ari's Take article, 150 uh, female producers you need to know? No, but I need to read it. Like you gotta yesterday. read it. <laughs> I'll send it to you. Um, I wrote it. I wrote it a year ago, um, and uh, but I, I I try to keep it updated. So other um, when you read it, send me more names to add because I'm I'm keeping it a kind of living list. Oh yeah, that's yeah. that's so great. Um, um, I, I there are so many that I look up to. Honestly, when I was at at Nam earlier this year, yeah, mm. this, it's still we're still in 2019. And I, I got in the elevator to go up to a meeting and then I realized that Leslie and Jones were standing next to me. And for a second, mm. I just could not breathe because I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is me, yeah. Leslie and Jones. And yeah. I, I I was so starstruck. I couldn't even work up the courage to say hi to her. And I emailed <laughs> her afterward. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that's the woman who mixes the Grammy show live. Yeah. Like wow. a woman at Skywalker. She's amazing. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So cool. Um, so amazing. So what does it take for somebody to, to get into the recording academy? Mm. So it, it, it depends on your credits first and foremost, and the number of credits varies depending on whether they're digital releases or physical product. And yeah. then they also want to look at, are you somebody who has a full-time job, but you have a band on the side and you just thought it'd be cool to put out an album, or is this something that you've you're very earnestly working at and is your primary passion and is mm-hmm. the way that you, you make money, mm-hmm. right? They want, they want career musicians. They don't want the dentist that thought it'd be fun to get together with his buddies and sure. put out an album on the side. Right. 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 So they, they changed the process very yeah. recently. And now what it used to just be an open enrollment, you would submit and you would eventually get a notification and said when you got in or not. But now there's a formal application and you need to get references. Mm. So you need, you need two people to endorse you and they don't have to be existing Academy members. Mm-hmm. They can be people of importance that um, carry weight, right? At, at labels or maybe it's a, a high level manager or somebody that works at a distributor. It really doesn't matter. It's just the two most important people in your life that are going to vouch for you. Mm. And they'll have to fill out a form that says how they know you, how long they've known you and write a nice little essay about why you'd be an asset as a recording Academy member. So there's an nice. open enrollment period. And I believe that will close in the beginning of March. If I'm not mistaken, but don't hold me to that. And then there's an evaluation period. And then we will welcome the class of 2020 in early summer. And is it just creators or can industry people get into the recording Academy as well? Well, so when you say industry people, I mean non creators, so non uh, artists, non musicians, producers, engineers, anyone who creates. If you are not a creator, you can still participate, but you don't have voting rights. 
there's the ability oh. for you to have maybe what you would call a professional membership and that will allow you to submit material mm. and it also allows you to maybe be eligible to participate on um, some early screening committees maybe but that's about as far as it goes it also allows you to participate in local boards but only up to a certain position okay so i think the highest that you can be on a local board if you're not a creator is secretary but in order to be vp president or trustee or anything else like that Mm -hmm. you've got to fundamentally be a musician gotcha and how many members are there about twenty thousand. Ish. Wow. Okay. And so when somebody wins a Grammy, that's because uh, the 20,000 members voted for it. That's because a portion of the 20,000 voted. I mean, I can't say that everyone votes. It's sort of like our, uh, any election, right? There are sure. 20,000 eligible voters, but yes, gotcha. it's the result of our voting pool. Voted. Yes. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so I think a lot of people don't realize how Grammys are even uh, awarded. And so it's the members and it's mostly, uh, you said, so it has, they have to be musicians because the, right. um, and then the musicians are voting. And, uh, and I will say something else that's really interesting that a lot of people don't understand is that uh-huh. material that's submitted, the material does not have to be by someone who's a recording Academy member. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. So you can still win a Grammy if you're not in the Recording Academy. That's right. It just has to be submitted by someone who has the authority to make that submission. So somebody with Are, a professional membership or is a voting member. Gotcha. That makes sense. Um, are... Um, are there thresholds in terms of, you said like credits, but is it uh, does it matter like how many streams you have or how many sales yeah. you have or... No, not at all. Okay. No. Okay. So they're like they're looking at real well, yeah, that's the basic numerical threshold is number of releases, but I don't yeah. think someone should be penalized because they don't perform as well on Instagram as um, maybe okay. some of their peers do. But for the recording academy, that's fundamentally not the point, right? It's we want people that are value creators that are full time musicians that um, that have a voice and a point of view and are creating valuable work. Mm-hmm. And that's not dependent awesome. on how many views you get on YouTube. Sure. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> um, right on. Cool. Um, so this uh, South by 2020, you're hosting, you're part of two panels. Are you mm-hmm. moderating both those panels? I am. It's, okay. it's kind of crazy because I've never, I, got, I went from never hosting a panel at South by to mm-hmm. having my first panel picker submission ever being accepted and then finding out that I was also nominated by a, a friend of mine at another company to host his, his panel. So I, that, that panel, right? Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And two is the maximum amount of panels that you can do during any South by Southwest. So I went from zero to doing the most that you can possibly do. Amazing. But, Amazing. Yes, it's very exciting. I, I love, I love Amuse. I love uh, Diego the founder and everything mm-hmm. that he stands for. They're yeah. for the people that don't know, they are kind of a wall esque in that it is a record label, but does not operate like a traditional record label. You could release a single with them. You can release an album with them. You could even release a single with them on sort of a, a lease basis mm-hmm. where they have the rights to it for a certain amount of time. And then after that lap, uh, lapses, you, the rights go back to you. Mm-hmm. So they're much more flexible with how they treat deals. Yeah. Um, so I'm very, I'm very excited about that, that panel. Cool. And that's the, uh, how to get paid. Show me the money. Show yeah. me the money. Right, right. Show me the money for indie artists. So, right. So uh, this, uh, if you're listening to this and going to South by, go check out Danny's panels, mm-hmm. uh, both that one, the show me the money. And then the one all about AI, which. I know uh, it's so, it's so <laughs> crazy. Literally this, this topic. I don't know if you saw the article that I posted today. Yeah, uh, I did. The Patent and Trademark Office. But what, which I I was wanted, like, yes, yes. That's, I was like, thank you, government, for right. writing out <laughs> all of the questions that I'm going to be asking at my South by panel. <laughs> right. It, right, it, right. It, it, I can't believe that everyone just is having the same conversation right now. It went mm-hmm. from nobody talking about it to everyone talking about it. 
And yeah. so this other panel I'm very excited about, it is about co-created songs. So who owns the copyright to an AI made piece of content? And, that's <laughs> and I love the, what the government is considering right now. Right. And I love that the lawyers that you quoted, like, they're like, I don't know. <laughs> oh. I was like, Cause like, how do you like, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't even, I don't know. I'm, I was like reading, no. I read a bunch of articles on it and I still am struggling to form an opinion about who should own the copyright. Um, and mm-hmm. I remember talking to, uh, this is funny. I was, remember talking to Taryn because Taryn actually, Taryn Southern called me um, before she released that album for advice on how to split up the royalties with the AI company that was creating, helping to create this album. And, mm-hmm. and I was like confused cause I was explaining, well, here's how it typically works with producers. And so mm-hmm. like, did they create it? Like, well, they didn't really create it. The machine created it. It's like, oh, well mm-hmm. then who owns, who's getting that producer cut? Should they get right. a cut of this? Or if it's just because I'm like, you know, Apple doesn't take a cut if you use logic uh, mm-hmm. or anything that they create, that's just kind of open source for them. It's, it's, um, royalty free. Um, mm-hmm. So that that's what's so interesting is because these AI companies, are they going to be demanding a cut of every release that they that gets put out? I don't know. Yeah, it's very interesting. And it, to give a little context for the, the people that are on the outside of this conversation, very right. specifically, what we are talking about is that the US Patent and Trademark Office, which advises on copyright for the government, mm-hmm. has put out uh, basically a questionnaire for the public to answer to help inform future decisions that might happen in the realm of law when it comes to AI and copyright. So like some of the questions that they're asking are, should a work produced by an AI algorithm or process without the involvement of a natural person contributing expression qualify as a work of authorship protectable under US copyright law? Why or why not? And then assuming involvement by a natural person should be required, how much is required in order for the person to assume authorship? And like these sound kind of crazy, but these aren't theoretical things that we have to dance around anymore. These are really things that we have to contend with because AI is already being used as a part of the creative process for Mm. so many people. And it's in our lives. We use it every day, I think, whether people realize it or not. And I think it's really smart that the government is opening up um, this inquiry and is seeking mm-hmm. public opinion. So if anyone does have opinions about any of this stuff, they should absolutely submit an inquiry because they mm-hmm. want to hear from creatives. Sure. That's, yeah, that's great. Have you written in? Um, not yet, but I do have until December. So, okay. All right. <laughs> well, uh, we need your voice in there, Danny. So right in there. I know because most people don't also, know what's up. <laughs> it's difficult because like you said, right. there are some of these questions. I really, truly really do not know where I lie. Mm-hmm. I don't know where my opinion is. I don't know what the line is for, yeah. uh, how, how much a human has to be involved in order for it to be considered a human made work. How many knobs or buttons or clicks does it require? Yep. I have no idea. And, yeah. Yep. It's, uh, it's quite uh, a place we're in right it's now a, in the history of music. Like, do you so. think if you go to a website, an AI music making website, mm-hmm. and you give it, a, we'll say the most basic parameter would be, I tell it the genre, and then I click generate. Mm-hmm. Do you think that the work that comes out of that should go to you as an author? I think I should own that uh, personally. You think you I think, uh, well, I think if I enhance it or create it, because I almost look at that as the software that almost kind of exists right now. Uh, like if you grab a, a a loop, you 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 know, just like a basic mm-hmm. drum loop or something from from Logic, and you just like say, okay, I wanted this kind of sound and snare, this kick, and uh, this hat, and this is the loop, and you put in the BPM. And now that's a loop and mm-hmm. I, I've basically created that. I told it what to do. So even by mm-hmm. you just guiding it, saying I want it to be this genre and like this and this and this, you're kind of mm-hmm. tweaking it. And then theoretically, ideally, you, you enhance it. And so it's not just, you don't just put out that, the AI generated song, but you enhance it with your vocals 
or other instrumentation or you chop it up or something. So you actually right. turn it into a final creation. See, so that's interesting because that you added that qualifier at the end. So it wasn't just that you click the button to generate the thing. It was that and you add a human component after the fact. Yes. And you, you sculpt I think it into something that you think would be uniquely yours. Yes, I think that's important um, because you can't just release. Uh, I mean, I guess you could, but um, you can. Yeah, yeah, I guess you, you can. <laughs> I mean, that, in, in that, that article that I published today, I, I've gone back to this case a couple of times, but I only mention it in every AI copyright piece because I feel like it's just so unique. Um, mm-hmm. But the the deal between Warner and and Dell, the the startup. Okay. That happened earlier this year. So Endel is a startup that creates Not sound Dell computers. No, Endel, E N D E L. Oh, gotcha. Okay. So Endel. it's a it's an app that generates soundscapes. So it's not it's not music per se, but it's relaxing stuff that you can put on the background if you're trying to fall asleep or you want mm. to meditate or you want something that in the background will work. But it's not musical, right? Mm. It's you know like layers of wind and violin strings and pretty sure. stuff right but it's not structured there's no mm-hmm. chorus or bridge or breakdown or what have you mm-hmm. anyway so they did a deal with warner to say we're going to sign 20 albums worth of output generated by your algorithm hmm. no human involvement other than they click the button to say generate 20 albums worth of material Hmm. And then arbitrarily sliced it up into 600 segments that were all about the same length. And then hired out to a third party company to name all the songs because naming 600 <laughs> right. tracks was just too much work. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> and, and now they, they have own 600 a... songwriting credits. Oh my gosh. And so now they're, and they could probably put these out onto uh, Spotify, a Spotify playlist. Things. Right, right. Um, yeah, like Peaceful Sounds playlist or something like that. Right, um, yeah. That's interesting wild. because that's like, that's like a work for hire almost. It's like mm-hmm. Warner is like commissioned. It's just like the, the songwriters and the artists that work at a sink house or something like that. And, you know, uh, they get commissioned by Toyota to, to write um, a new uh jingle or something like that it, that's like a work for hire that's not one of their original songs it's actually like for them and then you give up all your your ownership and you get paid for that and so it's kind of like that i suppose uh mm. that they, they made this a work for hire and so in that capacity i'm like okay i i'm i guess i'm more okay with that and that warner owns it because it's the same thing as just like work well, for they hires. Don't own it. They're just the distributor for it. But they did help facilitate all of the credits and getting them registered because these guys didn't know uh, even basic. So who owns, are they copywriting this stuff? I guess that's the question, right? Right. So the, yeah. the, the six dudes that founded the company and wrote the algorithm mm-hmm. own the copyright. Oh, oh isn't that interesting? interesting. Yes. That is very interesting. I right. probably, yeah, wouldn't expect that. Okay. So that's a weird gray area where, you know, I think maybe a coder might try to argue if you're, if you say I can't own the copyright for what my AI produces, you're disincentivizing me from creating, right? And mm-hmm. the creation is coding. It's creating the algorithm. And right. that takes a lot of time and mm-hmm. effort. And you don't want to take away from people innovating. Mm-hmm. But what happens when people put, I mean, sure, you can put like a year of time into an algorithm, but then that algorithm can generate a sheer amount of output in a very short amount of time, like seconds, right? Oh my gosh, right, right. What do you do with that? That feels very fundamentally different to me than, of course, what any human could accomplish. Mm. I mean, Right. And, and that's why I almost feel like the, the creators of that algorithm, that AI shouldn't necessarily own all of that. Um, it's almost like they're facilitating this. Um, but I feel like it will eventually get to a point where there's going to be, hopefully, that there's going to be pushback from the public. That's like, we don't, we don't want 
it, this, they're just not going to resonate with that on a mass scale, but maybe they will. I mean, I guess the, the peaceful sounds that's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, peaceful piano is one of the most popular playlists yes. on Spotify. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I know musicians, uh, personally who make their entire livings doing peaceful yep. piano music and distributing it to Spotify. It's, <laughs> it's so wild because I, maybe it was like a year, year and a half ago mm -hmm. when there was that whole rumor going around about the fake Spotify artists. Right. And right. I was the only person that did the research and actually figured out what was going on and yeah. talked to all the people that were named as fake artists, found right. the actual human beings, yeah. confirmed that they were human. Right. And it was just that they didn't want to be famous, but they liked making music. Right. And they were called, they were called fake because, uh, they didn't have, uh, like an Instagram for that artist's name and they weren't performing shows and they weren't like what we define as a traditional artist pursuing an artist's career and they had no press because they that's would trash. Right. <laughs> no, no, no. I, but that's, but that's why they were called fake. I mean, they were real yeah. humans and they were creating real music, but it was because what we define as what quote unquote real artists are, um, it's like, well, they're not pursuing a real artist's career. It's like, well... Well, a lot of the outcry matter. initially was that there was speculation that they were fake and that um, Spotify was actually generating, like, had some AI churning away and creating this stuff because most of the stuff that was existing under the quote-unquote fake category uh -huh. was stuff that was in these calm and peaceful playlists, mm -hmm. stuff that an AI could theoretically do because if they weren't hit pop songs or hit dance songs or things that an AI is not really capable of yet. So there was like this initial outcry of, you know, we think that because we can't find any information publicly about these people and well, wasn't that weird that they only have one or two songwriting credits and they don't have a presence online. So this must lead to this pattern that proves that Spotify is astroturfing their playlists with algorithm, algorithm created music. Right. And it wasn't the case. It's just some people just don't want to be found. Right. And, well, and it came to light that there was like some production houses where they employed these kinds of producers mm -hmm. uh, to create these these kinds of uh, these kinds of tracks. And yes, they would assign uh, random artist names to them. And so that's also where like the fake artist title kind of came mm -hmm. from is like they were just randomly assigned artist names then they weren't necessarily artists pursuing artist careers and it was production houses and then there was some conspiracies that like, feels well, very gatekeepery right like not pursuing a quote-unquote artist career i don't know right um, why is that necessary right right i i think yeah. there was a lot of jealousy that also went into that is like there are these artists that were like well why aren't i on a spotify playlist why are these mm -hmm. other mm -hmm. fake artists like i'm working my ass off and i'm like playing sure. shows and like why aren't i on the playlist but they these people that don't they are not real artists you know they don't pursue they're not grinding out in the clubs like they get to be on right. playlist, but not me right but i think there was a lot of that as well but they are grinding away you just in the don't studio care about it. yes, right. exactly exactly yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, well, that's interesting. And it's, man, it is such an interesting topic and the debate that we are going to continue to have, uh, whether we like it or not <laughs> for the next, <laughs> uh, foreseeable future. Um, and, and that's cool. And I, and I, I love that you have become kind of the de facto, uh, explainer of this whole <laughs> AI music scene. Someone's got to do it. Someone's got to do it. <laughs> and you're doing a great job with it. So, uh, uh, I yeah. did, I got a, a text from one of my lawyer friends today who I very much respect. And he said, well written, you're becoming the AI IP queen. Uh, yes. like, I will. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, it's, yes. Just, it's one of these really interesting intersections. I think a lot of people can't um, talk about with a lot of precision because it covers so many different topics. It mm -hmm. requires that you not only understand fundamentally what it means to be a musician, it requires that you also uh, no tangents to a degree, right? IP law, uh, music law, mm -hmm. um, and then technology. So th there's a lot of things that, that go into these very uh, nuanced arguments. And there aren't a lot of people that are equipped to talk about it. And yeah. I, I, I lean a lot on my friends who are experts, and I'm, I'm learning new things every day myself. And I'm as you saw in the article that was posted today, mm -hmm. even the experts are stumped and they, right. they frankly say, you know, a lot of times they don't know. 
And I, uh, one copyright lawyer friend told me that this discussion around AI and copyright is probably one of the most existential that uh, we're going to have in a very long time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> totally true. I mean, when lawyers are stumped and they're the most confident motherfuckers on the planet, it's <laughs> like, <laughs> like, all right, we know we're onto something that's, that is uh, awfully confounding. Yeah. So, yeah, totally. <laughs> cool. Well, Danny, thank you so much for being a part of this. I have one final question uh, that I ask everybody. And uh, what is your definition of making it in the new music business? Oh, that's interesting. Hmm. I knew there's a reason why I just have to consider it. Right now. Um, I, I think making it is, is an individual definition. I think some people would define making it as I... I'm able to work enough to pay my bills and that's all that I need. And I feel that I get enough from that. There are some people where they don't get any income at all, but they just want to put their stuff out into the world. Like my brother, bless his heart. He's an amazing dance music producer, has no interest or business ability when it comes to the the other side of things, but he just wants to put his stuff out on SoundCloud. Mm. And for him, it's just enough to make the material. Mm. He just wants to be able to have the creative expression. I think making it is a very subjective term that is down to an individual definition. Some people are never satisfied and feel like they've never made it, even when they're on the top of the mountain. Mm -hmm. Imposter syndrome is a very real thing in our world. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I don't feel like I've made it for what it's worth. (laughs) <laughs> Isn't that funny? I'm reading your bio beforehand and my jaw is on the floor. I'm <laughs> like, what hasn't she done? <laughs> and then here you're saying, I don't feel like I've made it. And I think that's, I, but that's not surprising to me uh, just because uh, I'm in a similar boat. And I think most artists, many artists who I talk to who are touring theaters are like, I haven't made it. I'm not playing arenas. I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> right. You keep raising the bar. Yes. Right? Yes. And I, I think part of that is almost fundamentally necessary because the moment that you become content with where you are, then that stops. Yep. And if you are content with that and that's where you want to be, that is absolutely fine. But I mm-hmm. think a lot of people that operate in creative fields, um, it is, it is never enough. There's a piece of our brain that wants to feel validated by getting bigger and bigger opportunities and we feed off of public response. And um, it's not enough to make it for ourselves a lot of times. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, Ugh, you know, yeah, I played really failed last year with Fall Out Boy, but right. is that really is that enough? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, the next question is right. What is enough? What is enough? <laughs> That's the next ex- existential conversation for another time. Uh, do you, right. I mean, do you feel like we've made it? Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I well, well, no. I, I define it similarly, though. It's very personal, and I find um, I, I feel that I um, no, I feel like I am making it, and that I mm-hmm. feel like making it is. Uh, making a a living, supporting the kind of lifestyle that I want to have doing what I love. So in that respect, I do feel that I um, have made it in that, in that realm, but I, that's a really interesting distinction though, because that tense change actually changes a lot. Mm -hmm. When you say I've made it, that feels Mm -hmm. more like peaking, right? Like there's nowhere else for you to go. But when you say I'm making it, I'm making it happen. Mm -hmm. It feels very active and more fluid to me. Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I like that. Cool. Mm-hmm. Okay, <laughs> right so I'm, I'm making it too. <laughs> yes, damn right. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Dope. All right, well, Danny, thank you so much uh, for being a part of this. This is a really fascinating conversation, and um, we'll talk soon.